I am, and he is. Um, and he just stepped down last year from running a program comparable to STEP in some ways, uh, called the Science, Technology, and International Affairs Program at Georgetown University. He has a second half of career in academia, started in a sense at Princeton, when between 87 and 91, he, alongside Frank von Hippel, was running the embryonic STEP uh, that when Kamen and Andrews came a year later, and Clint, and Clint Andrews talked last week, uh, it became uh, a fuller program with faculty commitments. Um, Chuck had his, has his PhD from Harvard in photosynthesis and was a serious fundamental scientist for a short while, then went to the World Bank as the first scientist in residence. Worked on the technology of agriculture in particular, and broadened and broadened and broadened his interests in aspects of science, and deepened his as interest in aspects of science policy across many different arenas and generalizing to issues like the role of the private sector. He wrote a book that has just come out, reviewers have people who come in yet, uh, which will be the basis of his talk called Technology Innovation in Legacy Sector. I'll let Chuck explain what legacy sectors are. Suffice to say that this is one of the most profound discussions of this topic that you're going to find. Let's welcome Chuck Weiss. Well, thank you, Rob, and thank you for that lovely introduction. And it's great to be back here. And I'll see if I can get this thing to work. There we are. That's the, uh, that's the cover of the book. There's actually a copy sitting outside. And, uh, you, can buy, you can buy one from the Shameless Copper Commerce Division of Oxford Press. So let's get down to, let's get down to business. Um, American history is, uh, has a basic theme of Willie West. Don't like your neighborhood? Put all your stuff in the covered wagons. Go west across the mountains to new territory. And this applies to technology as well. We like to stand up new technology, solve new problems in open fields, computing. Um, we go west, we pack up our, our technological covered wagons, we go west, and we leave all the legacy problems, all the stuff we didn't like, the, trouble, the stuff we're trying to get away from, we leave those behind on the east coast. Here. Okay. Um, well, the problem with going back east is that it's occupied territory. If you have a technology that's trying to fix something that's been there a long time, people are going to shoot at you. So we don't like to do technological west to east. We like to do biotech. We don't go back and fix the health delivery system. And I'm going to argue that there'd be a lot of gains if we, if we bit the bullet. I keep shifting metaphors, but if we bit the bullet and looked at the east coast, the what I'm going to call legacy sectors, and I'll explain to you what I mean in more detail in a minute, and that this will help us with a lot of the big problems that we face, and I don't have to tell you what they all are. Uh, you're mostly concerned here with climate and energy, but you've got food and nutrition, jobless innovation having to do with manufacturing jobs, healthcare delivery, higher education, K-12 science education, there's a lot of them. And these problems, as one of our reviewers said, are hidden in plain sight. We really have to deal with these legacy sectors if we're going to solve some of our major challenges. So I'm going to try to talk about how we can go about doing this. Um, it's not hopeless, I would argue. One of the major transformations in the legacy sector took place in the military after the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War left our military in terrible shape. Uh, public uh, support was, was way down. This organization, what's the mission? But some, uh, some visionaries in the Defense Department conceived what became the revolution in military affairs, precision strike, uh, drone warfare, other major, uh, major um, innovations in military technology, despite the legacy characteristics that we'll talk about briefly uh, in, the, in the services. And we argue in the book that there is potential for this kind of innovation in 
a number of uh, legacy sectors, advanced manufacturing, driverless cars, online education, and so on. Okay. Uh, since I'm going to be in the weeds, I'm going to give you the, the take-home lessons before, uh, before I go give you the details. Um, first, these are the obstacles to disruptive innovation in legacy sectors yet to be defined. Uh, have important implications for innovation in environment as well. I put that up front because I know this seminar is, is primarily concerned with energy and environment, although our book is much broader than that. Um, the point here is that if we look at these legacy sectors, um, we will find important needed innovations that um, are not confined to the kind of shining light, cutting edge innovations that are the major focus of American innovation policy. Secondly, the barriers to innovation in legacy sectors have a lot in common, even though these sectors are quite disparate, they're quite different, but the barriers are comparable in, in, in many of them, and they have important environmental implications. Third, if we're going to be serious about encouraging innovation in these le legacy sectors, whether it's for environment or for, for employment or for public health or any other, uh, any other virtue, um, we have to look at the whole innovation process. That means that we don't assume that supporting research and development will automatically lead to innovation. We don't have to worry about it. We have to think about the whole process. We have to ask what are the likely barriers to the scale up and uh, and widespread commercialization or other application of the technology. You have to look at barriers to scale up and to market launch. Fourth, we have to look at the context of innovation. Uh, and that, that this can be as important as the innovation system, which gets most of the attention. We spend most of our time in innovation research, looking at universities, relations with, the, with, the, with industry, career paths, and so on. But there are a lot of broader contextual issues that separate the sheep from the goats in this area. And finally, although I won't spend a lot of time on that today, manufacturing is a very important legacy sector. It's an important job, it's source of jobs and an important source of innovation. It's usually thought of as a fairly humdrum subject, not worthy of attention, but I'm going to argue that that is really the right approach. Um, the book sets forth a integrative modeling, what do you call it, a unifying analytical framework. Um, it's built on the work of a lot of previous people. There's Freeman, Carlotta Perez, Werner Rattan, Clayton Christensen, going back to Cabrati, and a number of others. Um, but we found that when we're thinking through what you have to do to encourage innovation in the le legacy sector, uh, you, have to fill, you have to fill in a lot of interstices, and you have to pull, off, pull a lot of things together. And a decent amount of our book is devoted to that. The reason why we had to do this is that we had to look at all the steps in the innovative process. We had to look at the barriers to innovation in many disparate sectors. We had to treat in detail the role of the government. We had to look at the effect of the context on the demand for innovation, not just the supply that comes out of the innovation system, the labs and the universities and so on. And when we got the thing done, we realized that it was applicable to a number of other countries. We applied it to a number of European countries, uh, to China and others. And it turns out to have interesting results. Oops, that's the wrong thing. Okay, so what do I mean by a legacy sector? These are sectors that are defended against disruptive innovation by a paradigm, a multidimensional paradigm. There's a technological element, there's an economic element, a political element, social, cultural, legal paradigms. It makes it very tough to disrupt these technologies. These, uh, these technologies. And they also provide incentives to producers that don't align with societal objectives. This is a familiar situation for this audience because you're quite used to it in the environment. And all the, the, these paradigms coupled with market imperfections make it possible for them to resist disruptive innovations. That doesn't mean that innovations don't happen in these legacy sectors. There's plenty of them. 
but they have to fit the paradigm. Otherwise, they face high obstacles, especially if they are driven by externalities, if the reason that you want these innovations to happen have to do with things that are not driven by the market. Um, and these obstacles to innovation are also obstacles to environmental innovation. Uh, they're defended by vested interests, they share common features, and the last bullet point is a, a subject <coughs> because often you read in the newspapers or in special pleading documents, ah, if the government would just get out of the way, why we would have all these wonderful innovations, all these regulations are inhibiting things that we want. Well, as we will see, sometimes the government's in the way, and at least as often, the government is guiding innovation in a desirable direction because there are important environmental or public health or safety or other public goods that need to be addressed by innovation. Okay. Now, since this is an energy seminar, I'm starting with fossil fuels, which is your poster child for a legacy sector. Um, what makes it a legacy sector? Well, here are uh, many of them. Here are some of the characteristics, almost all of the characteristics that we find across the uh, range, of the disparate range of um, legacy sectors. Perverse prices that don't reflect externalities. That's a related situation. No carbon charge that doesn't cost anything for, to, 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 to charge the oil companies for defending the Persian Gulf, and so on. A well-established and very elaborate infrastructure, public expectations of cheap energy is considered to be a God-given right in this country. Uh, our politicians are judged by the price of energy. Career paths in university curricula. If you want to be an oil engineer, there are lots of places to study it. Um, regulatory requirements, which, which place obstacles before uh, possible competing disruptive technologies. If you want to put a wind farm or a, a big solar farm uh, in a place where the resources are probably richest, you're probably a long way from the grid. You'll have to string a lot of high tension wires. Um, you're, if each county you pass has different permitting requirements. It's, it, it'll drive an entrepreneur nuts. And there are other regulatory issues which we'll talk about. Limited research and development compared to, uh, compared to revenue. Uh, Dan Kamen, who, who launched this program, uh, has a nice paper showing that the uh, relatively small proportion of energy revenue that's devoted to uh, r and and energy, and I don't have to talk to you about the vested interests that are involved in the energy sector. Um, some of these, uh, these uh, obstacles are best characterized as market imperfections that hinder uh, new technologies, especially renewables, uh, perverse subsidies, for example, oil depletion allowances and a lot of other uh, tax incentives for the use of virgin materials, uh, networking, network economies that have to be built up. Um, sometimes you can do it from a niche, niche market and sometimes you can't. Non-appropriability, uh, this is familiar, I'm sure, to many of you. Uh, if I'm a landlord, I don't, uh, if I can, I can put in investment in insulation, uh, you, the tenant, will benefit, but you probably don't want to pay your rent for it. If I'm a builder, same story, it's hard for me to pass on conservation investments to a prospective buyer because they, their, their, um, their expectations of payback are unrealistic. Lumpiness is a curious one, but there are a number of major technologies that have important environmental and energy implications carbon capture and sequestration, next generation nuclear enhanced geothermal being the three of the biggies, um, where in order to prove these things out, you're going to need major investments in demonstrations, billion dollar investments, numerous billion dollar investments, just to see whether the technology is any good. And it's really very important to know, for example, whether carbon capture and sequestration is going to work in the gigaton range. It means a lot for the, for the uh, natural gas and the coal industry, for example. Either it's going to work or it's not going to work, we want to know that too. Um, but there's a minimum size here. And the, the cancellation of programs uh, on CCS, just as an example of how important it is to have the expectation, at least, of, of, of uh, prices that are going to reflect externalities. Uh, otherwise, nobody is going to put in this kind of money into investments in, the, in these demonstration projects. Needs for collective action. Um, quite important in the building industry, which is undercapitalized, difficult to get the money together or the interest together for 
for building research. It's also true in organic agriculture. Um, it's also true in a number of renewables. Uh, venture financing time horizons. Um, our venture capital people in Silicon Valley or anywhere else are very good if you have a project that will cash out in five to seven years. If a project that's going to take 10, 12, it's much harder. Um, by comparison, if you have an innovation that's compatible with the paradigm, it will go beautifully. Fracking, taking off beautifully. You can argue about the, the environmental implications, but if you're just interested in whether the innovation is taking off, it's going fine because it fits the paradigm very well. Well, here's some other legacy sectors. Manufacturing, the electric grid, transportation, higher education, um, transport, health delivery. It's quite a disparate list. So our argument is that the problems you're seeing in the energy and environment system, with which you're all familiar, um, you'll find comparable obstacles in this rather disparate list of, of, uh, of sectors. Um, I, I don't suppose you want me, want me to go through all of this, but I'll give you a few examples. In the, the interstate electric grid, you have a patchwork of regulatory authorities. Um, some states are regulated, some states are not. Some states are in regional, um, regional networks, some states are not. If, for example, you're in, a, you're in a state that's regulated, and you're, that means that you get a guaranteed rate of return on your investment, which means that your regulatory authority wants to know about all your investments because they're going to increase the rates that your rate payers have to pay. So you come to their, your regulators and you say, it's very important that we have a more reliable, more efficient, less carbon dioxide emitting interstate grid and they say, that's very nice. Is that going to benefit our ratepayers? And they say, yes, it is. Uh, is it, are all the benefits going to come to our ratepayers? Oh, no. The next state over is going to get some, rate pay, some benefits, too. Ah, we're just in the business of benefiting our ratepayers. That's called non-appropriability. It's just like the, the landlord that I was talking about before. And in this particular case, the vested interest of the regulators that don't want to give up their power. So there's a case where governments in the broad sense are in the way. Um, industrial agriculture, again, farmers all over the country are relatively undercapitalized, at least not well enough capitalized to do their own large-scale research. But they solve that problem by influencing what the U.S. Department of Agriculture does. The organic, the organic agriculture, sustainable agriculture people try to do the same thing, but they don't have the same cloud. So they have a collective action project problem. Um, Rodale does research, but that's their small potatoes by comparison. Health delivery systems. Major uh, problems of network economies in patient information delivery. You need somebody to impose standards for interoperability. Uh, this happens with the Veterans Administration, happens with the Defense Department, happens with Medicare, but that hasn't been enough to impose the kind of standards that assure interoperability of patient, um, patient records. And I'm told there are problems, to my surprise, I was told that there are similar problems with back office, uh, back office software, although I don't understand those as well. Um, and there's also the non-appropriability issue here. The doctor is going to turn his office or her office upside down uh, to drive, drive, uh, drive their, uh, their staff crazy for a couple of months while they learn the system, get the bugs out, but they can't pass that cost on to patients. The patients take it for granted that if she moves to uh, San Francisco, she'll be able to get her, her digital records. Um, in the buildings, we've already talked about the non-appropriability issues and the collective action, action issues. Higher education, I don't want to get too, uh, too close to the bone here. Um, <laughs> there, uh, there, are, um, there are important vested interests. Uh, I'm a former faculty member, I guess I get to say that. Um, there's perverse pricing. GW raised its tuition uh, at George Washington University in Washington, wanted to improve its profile and to get better, uh, stronger students and to have more prestige. They raised tuition and it worked like a charm, just like perfume or champagne. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, I hope the president has said well here before. Um, 
<laughs> the collective action problem here is acute. And the lack of research, I mean, there's loads of engineering research here, but research on learning methods? No. That's a collective action problem that has not been, uh, that has not been addressed at serious scale. And for, the, um, for science education, K-12 science education, uh, I learned to my surprise, uh, I'm now a visiting scholar at AAAS, so I, I met the people who are worrying about K-12 science education. There's serious collective action problems in the K-12 science program because it's done by, the, such research as is done, such innovation is done, done by the testing companies, done by the textbook companies, um, that have very different things in mind. Um, so you have a serious collective action problem, and uh, I guess we're all part of the vested interests here. Um, military. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the military, but it's an interesting chimera. You have, a, um, you have the services that are quite devoted to their traditional functions, their traditional missions, and every so often you need some new concept, like, like drones, like stealth bombers, like precision, precision strike, that could turn everything upside down in, in, uh, in military tactics. For this, you needed DARPA, the Defense uh, Advanced Projects, Defense Advanced Research Projects Administration, I got it right, um, that has a very special organization that I'll talk about in a minute, that is able, by dint of its relative freedom from service missions, but its connection with the department, with the, with the secretary, with the, with the Defense Department uh, Research Institute, that's able to push these things through. And before there was DARPA, there was Admiral Rickover, who had similar push. Okay, now I want to talk briefly about innovation context, because the context in which innovation takes place or doesn't take place, uh, doesn't really get a lot of attention in the innovation literature. You read a lot about the innovation system, labs, universities, career paths, and so on, uh, human resources, intellectual property, you don't read a lot about the context. It's usually, it, it usually gets brief men mentioned, and then you get onto the really interesting stuff. Well, the reason that cutting edge innovation takes place much better in the US than most other countries has to do with context. And this is a multi-dimensional multi context. Uh, on the economic side, you have a huge, relative, oops, sorry, a relatively unregulated internal market, flexible labor market, very low, mobile labor market, uh, stable macroeconomics, favorable business climate, portable pensions. That doesn't sound like it has much to do with technology. But if your pensions are tied to where you live or where you work, and you can't take it to another job, that kills the kind of job mobility that's taken for granted in Silicon Valley. I'm not going to do a lot of comparative talk about the comparative stuff here. But as you look at these, this list, think France, think Germany, think China. And you'll find that these positives in the United States have a lot to do with the problems that these other countries are having in getting the, uh, getting the kind of cutting edge innovation that is the, um, the American specialty. We have a country, a culture that welcomes novelty, that welcomes disruption. If you want to uh, try something, uh, get people excited about it, you say it's new, it's exciting. Uh, in many European countries, so what you would say is, gee, you'll like this stuff, it's just like grandma. It would be very familiar to you. We're proud of individualism. We accept failure. A lot of countries, you start a business, you fail, you are, you are, your career is finished. Here, you fail once, you go to the VC company and you say, uh, I failed, but here's a new idea. Well, you probably learned something about the last, she probably learned something about it last time. Maybe we'll fund this one too, it looks like a good idea. Um, relatively indifferent to social origin, religion, gender, education. You can argue about whether that's good enough, whether we're good enough in these areas, but again, relative to other countries, we're much more rewarding of merit, never mind what color you are. And the basic legal structure is there. Intellectual property, commercial laws, bankruptcy laws particularly. If, you're, if your company is broke, you can go out of business. Nobody's gonna say you can't go out of business, you've gotta protect the jobs, right? Might get a little protection, but it's not not uh, not to the same extent as other countries. This, despite many problems that we have that I don't have to tell you about, education system, spotty, 
fiscal infrastructure, look at our roads. Uh, we're talking about legacy sectors, neglect of environmental externalities. I don't, certainly don't have to tell you about that. Most important, the one on the bottom. We said before that in order to facilitate innovation in these legacy sectors, we have to look at the whole innovation process from, from Douglas to Zach, from, from research through to market launch. But that requires a certain understanding of the people and the political system, that that's a legitimate thing to do. And if you're going to do that, you're going to take risks. Two things are going to go broke. So take the, the, the Solyndra, uh, the famous Solyndra uh, solar company that, that went broke, cost the government, I think, half a billion dollars in, in loan guarantees. Well, anytime you lose half a billion dollars, it's going to be a political issue. Um, and probably somewhere in there, there's going to be some political connection that people can attack. But underlying it, it would help if there was the general notion was, yeah, this is something that government should do. It's essential for certain kinds of innovation. It went wrong in this case, and we're going to find out why. But in general, this makes sense to do, because we don't, if you're unwilling to do this, there are a lot of innovations that, are never, that will never happen. And that, that was not the case here. So this is part of a broader, uh, a broader argument that we make in the book. This is, here's a definition of the innovation system. These are the firms, the institutions, and the policies that are specifically concerned with carrying out and facilitating and supporting research, development, innovation, and technological capacity. And there's the familiar list of, there, familiar list of institutions that constitute this system. There's a lots of research on the subject and the policies that provide research support, <coughs> provide IP protection, support graduate education, venture capital, prizes for innovation, public procurement. All of these things are part of the innovation system, and they're very important. Innovation context doesn't get the same kind of attention. If you read an Academy report on the innovation, uh, uh, problems of innovation in a particular country, uh, it'll maybe have a page or two on this, and then, 20 pages on all the labs. And I'm arguing that this is just as important. Um, and if you look at comparable, at, at comparative countries, you'll see that this is a very important rule, uh, a very important um, variable, input variable. And we already talked about it in the US context, cultural attitudes for risk and individualism and competition, and university industry co cooperation. Again, to appreciate this, just think of the opposite, and think of other countries that you know, Accepting social mobility, accepting pro promotion on merit, accepting failure, being relatively indifferent to, to gender, sexual preference, ethnic origin, family, class, alumni. All of this stuff can be very important in other countries, critically important. Uh, economic, macro, the macro situation, exchange rates, prices, administered prices, taxes. Can you get to a finance? Can you get to, can you get to the bank for a new idea? And so on. Um, on the political side, stability, relatively free of corruption, relatively reasonable regulation, all kinds of legal structures. Think of the contrast between this and, say, uh, a, a good, a good kleptocracy, a favorite kleptocracy. Um, and I would argue that this, are, this, this is as important in the system, uh, again, this is as important to the rate and the direction of innovation, whether innovation is, is environmentally interesting, whether it uh, promotes public safety, and so on. If you folks want to come up here, there are a couple of seats here. There are seats here. You don't have to stand. <laughs> come on. Come on. There are several seats right over here, please. Well, as I said, I'm not going to do a lot of comparative. There's, there's, a, there's a couple of comparative chapters in the book. But just briefly, um, if you have a kleptocracy, if after you spend 10 years building up a business, uh, people come and visit you and say, gee, that's a nice business you've got here. I'll take half of it. Um, you're probably not going to spend the 10 years. And I'm describing a discouraging number of countries, including some that put decent money into their R&D. Um, those of you who are into development perhaps know the story in post-colonial India, where you've had this tremendous, uh, tremendously over-regulated country. Uh, once you had a license to produce something, you didn't have to improve your technology or improve your product. You had a, you had a money tree and just had to just sell, sell the same old junk. And despite the fact that India put in a good deal of money into their research and development, um, 
the stuff you can find in the, in the store is not very good. Um, if you're interested in obstacles to the kind of cutting edge innovation that <coughs> you specialize in, then it's interesting to look at Germany, France, and China, which each have very great strengths. The Germans are extremely good in manufacturing, especially in capital goods where quality counts and there isn't a lot of, um, of price elasticity. People are willing, they, it's very important to their, to, to their to the quality of their product. They're willing to pay extra and they're not going to save a nickel in, uh, and risk putting out a bad product. The Germans are particularly good at this and the whole system is set up to support that kind of small and medium manufacturing. You know, no more. It's a wonderful National Academy study, or as we summarized in the book. Uh, France, the Grand Ecole system, uh, the, this, the system of, of engineering oriented administrators, puts out very good infrastructure, but again, the context is not favorable for cutting edge. China, a uh, complicated story, a very strong <coughs> manufacturing scale up, very strong in, in many kinds of infrastructure because they're expanding like crazy, uh, good IT for local markets, but having trouble getting out of the media. Uh, the medium income trap and having trouble uh, upgrading to, to really cutting edge. <coughs> um, so the things we can learn from these countries, but they're tearing their hair trying to figure out how they can emulate us, and their problems are on the contextual side. There's a famous quote from a British minister in a particular context, but he said, sure, we could do all of these things. All we had to do was turn our social structure completely out. Completely <laughs> okay. Now, I want to talk briefly about models of innovation, which will segue into things that can be done to encourage innovation uh, in these legacy sectors. I'll go through this relatively quickly. I don't know how familiar uh, you, you are with this thing. But the main thing, the, the main takeaway is that with a, a countable number of exceptions, the US innovation policy is based on the pipeline model. We, going back to Vannevar Bush, right at the end of World War II, we support basic research and we assume, except in aerospace and agriculture <coughs> and health, we assume that the, tech, the um, commercialization will take care of itself. Um, that's a technology push, a supply-oriented uh, model called the pipe, which we call the pipeline model. There are other names for it as well. Now, there's another model that originally emerged from the fact that Great Britain was wonderful in basic research, it was terrible at uh, commercializing it, called the induced innovation model, which is a demand-pull model. Some smart entrepreneur, male or female, realizes there's a market niche, realizes that technology is ready to roll, we call them inducible technologies, and uses those technologies in order to make a new product. Uh, typically, these are incremental technology advances, but that's not necessary. And you can induce them by changes in policy. You can induce them by changes in price. Uh, you put in a new environmental policy. Suddenly, countries get uh, companies get interested in satisfying that. Uh, they have the choice; they can fake it too, as you may have noticed in the recent papers. But anyway, that's another story. Now, in order to develop our models and our our our, our intervention um, approaches, we had to develop several new models of what we call the dynamics of innovation, which is also uh, the, the role of government. The first is standard in the Defense Department, the extended pipeline model. It's still technology push, but it looks at the entire innovation process. They will put the uh, DOD will support the development, demonstration, test beds, and even the initial, the creation of the initial market. A fourth area, which I, to which I alluded before, and which often gets neglected, is the idea of, ma of manufacturing-led innovation. Because we consider typically manufacturing to be a humdrum, stable, kind of static kind of thing. It's not. To take an idea and turn it into something that can be mass-produced, and that works every time, and that somebody that doesn't have a PhD can get it to work without any trouble, that is a major creative effort. <coughs> um, this is the, the main the easy way to, to uh, exemplify that is the, the, the creation of quality manufacturing in Japan uh, that led to Toyota and Honda's dominance of the automobile market for a long time. Um, you can also point to China. China is, is very good at scaling up um, a, a, a technology 
the, uh, the latest Apple products are made in China and couldn't be made anywhere else. Um, they, and, and also, they, 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 can, they, can, um, they can design up, they can also design down. If you want a cheap electrocardiogram that's good for India or Africa, uh, they, they can sell you one. If you want a cheap motorcycle, it's not quite as good as a Yamaha, but it'll run and it'll sell in Africa. They're very good at that underappreciated area for innovation. Finally, is the most comprehensive model, which this is, comes from Bill, uh, my, my co-author Bill Bonvillian. I've been calling this my book, but it's our book. Bill, Bill Bonvillian is the, uh, um, he, he was Senator Lieberman's legislative director for a long time. He drafted most of the innovation-oriented legal uh, laws and, and the recent laws in the country. Um, and uh, he's now the uh, head lobbyist, the chief of the Washington office for MIT, which means that he's the major, um, the major lobbyist for academic science and engineering in the country. So he knows his business very well. And great pleasure working, working with him. The point of the innovation organization model is that it incorporates the other models and it applies them as needed. Um, and it takes account of the broad context and structure in which you're going to introduce an innovation. If it foresees a, an obstacle, it tries to deal with it. Um, and it depends on a change agent somewhere that can orchestrate the whole environment. By the environment, I mean the uh, innovation system and the innovation um, the context. Um, so three of these models are new, um, and three of them involve a major role for the government. Quite different from the pipeline model, which is what most of us carry in the back of our heads. If we just finance basic research, everything would be okay. Um, briefly, oh, now, so what does this mean? To summarize, to summarize we need an innovation policy that looks not only at the R&D, but also where the jobs are going to come from. This is the stuff on manufacturing that I lost over very quickly. Um, we need to look at the gaps in the system, both in the research side and at the back, what, what Bill calls the back end of the innovation process, the demonstration, test bed, manufacturing, and market launch. That means that the government needs to look beyond the pipeline model as to support research, but also look to obstacles that can be foreseen and start working on it. Because the reason, the reason for that is that the timeline for developing the kind of political constituency for dealing with these issues is comparable to the timeline for getting the technology going. So you don't want to neglect one or the other. If you neglect the policy side, you remove a lot of the incentive to do the research. And if you neglect the research side, then the policy guys say, why should I bother with this? There's no technology is ready to roll anyway, so the heck with it. Okay, so Bill produces, presents the following five-step framework for dealing with legacy <coughs> sectors, uh, which I present to you. Although usually we do this as a tag team and he presents these slides. The first thing you do is to make sure you've got some innovations to talk about, which means that you have to strengthen the R&D side of things. Um, the, as he says there's no innovation without innovation. There's no innovation without innovations. You've got to have it. Um, I've got to have them. Um, if there is not, if it's really a neglected area, You've got to build the thinking community that's going to think about these issues. Those of you who know about the origins of, uh, of the internet, think lit lighter, and the, the process of getting people to think about issues of pulling the different networks together. Um, if you're going to use advanced ideas and linking them to an application, the researchers have to be uh, in communication with the operators from the beginning. And the, the, the researchers have to understand the ultimate problems, and the people who are in charge of dealing with the ultimate problems have to be aware of the possibilities of research. But, and this is the point of this island bridge. Oh, what have I done? Sorry. They don't use any of these things in the School of Foreign Service. <laughs> One more. Oh well, but the sorry. What do I know? It goes back. I guess. There we go. There we go. We got it. Um, DARPA, which is the major 
ex uh, exemplar of this approach and has been, uh, has been imitated by the Energy Department, by, uh, by Health and Human Services, and by the uh, CIA and the, um, uh, the NSA, uh, with pluses and minuses for their results. But the point is that if you're going to have this kind of a group, it has to be sufficiently isolated from immediate operational pressures, and yet be well enough understood by the people on the operating side that they appreciate its importance, without, but they understand that they can't control it, they can't say, hey, we need this problem, it's, a, it's urgent problem, it's very important, we need an answer in six months. So, no, I'm sorry, you have your own labs for that. We have, this is a longer term business. Um, and in order to, to preserve this kind of independence, DARPA has had to have relations with the Secretary of Defense to defend it against the immediate operational um, pressures. And if that hasn't happened, um, DARPA gets into trouble. That's why the, the job of being director of DARPA is a very challenging one. Okay, so while you are, while you are dealing with the front end with the, our research and development capability, making sure that there's going to be a supply of ideas so that, we'll, so that you will have a plausible case. If you change the policies, the technologies will emerge. Well, these inducible technologies, they're within range. They're not there yet, they're not big enough yet, they're not perfect yet, but you can see that if you change the policy, the technology will come. Um, you also need to think about, okay, suppose you have the technology, what are we going to have to do to get it to launch at full scale? If it's obvious, problems, we better deal with them. If you have it, you're in trouble. Think of the, of the pressures on the, on the solar industry now. If there, were, uh, if there were carbon charges, it would be a lot easier to, uh, to introduce solar PVs, which are now much cheaper than they used to be. But in a sense, it's unfair to expect solar PV to be cheaper than coal, because coal doesn't have to pay its externalities. These are, these are, are arguments that you, that you are all familiar with. Having identified the launch path, then you say, okay, what policies do I need to overcome them? And what are the gaps in the innovation system that we have to, uh, that we have to uh, fill? Uh, and, and so you identify them and you fill them. Um, this requires a change agent. This requires the kind of leadership that you had uh, with, with the Department of Defense. This involves the kind of leadership that you had in the, uh, the, of, in the Department of of energy in the last few years and so on. People that are prepared to orchestrate and intervene in the legacy system. And this requires the application of innovation organization model. Okay, so we're almost done. Uh, what is the legacy sector? It's a large part of the economy, probably more than half, resists innovation unless it fits this multi-dimensional paradigm. It uh, had these legacy sectors share a, in common a series of barriers and market imperfections that you can watch across a disparate range of sectors. Um, we invented this new idea called the innovation environment, which is the sum of the innovation system and the innovation context, and <coughs> each of those have uh, many components. This idea applies not only to the US, but to many other countries, and is an interesting way of comparing the US system, the strengths and weaknesses of the US system with the strengths and weaknesses in the innovation environment in other countries. <coughs> we introduced five models for innovation. Um, when we said that for a, a well-entrenched legacy sector, uh, you really need to, to uh, uh, employ or to apply uh, well, five of them, the fifth one incorporating the previous four. Uh, and we have to look not only at research and development, but at a wide variety of policies, including some that seem to be quite distant from innovation, from, from high-tech innovation. We didn't have time to talk about manufacturing, but the book has a, has a chapter on this, which basically summarizes a very important study out of MIT, which, to which Bill was an advisor, Bill was an advisor. But the bottom line is that this is a legacy sector. Um, we've offshored most of our manufacturing, and with it, we've offshored a, a variety of services, what they call the industrial ecosystem, that are essential underpinnings for small and medium industry. The high-tech stuff and the multinationals 
They don't mind offshoring this ecosystem to China or elsewhere, to be closer to markets, to be closer to production facilities. But the small and medium industries care a lot. Um, and we outlined a five-step framework for bringing innovation into legacy sectors. And again, I end with the shameless, in the shameless commerce division that outside, if you really want to buy this book, uh, you can get a, I think it's a 50 percent discount. And there's a copy of Italy for And I thank you very much for listening to me all this time. Well, you know, when we originally wrote it, when we originally saw the design, there was a, a top, and it, there was a there was a peak, and it wasn't clear whether it was going to make it or not make it. And then gradually, the sort of like that side eroded, and now it, it, actually there's more of the hill, and there's more of the rock that's there. And the idea is it's it's a it's a big job, and there's a lot of obstacles, and it's not so easy. And actually. One of the things we don't deal with, which came up and we had Father Rob and I, both friends obviously, and we had dinner last night. The politics of the change agent is not, is, it, that's a serious issue, and one that's important for, uh, for, uh, for research. What is it that made, made it possible to have a change agent in the Department of Defense and in other, in other examples that makes it so hard elsewhere? Um, that's maybe one of the graduate students in the office. I'll start it. I suspect there are quite a few questions in the room. Would you ask people to identify themselves? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Go first. Hi. Um, I'm a graduate student in the chemistry department. Um, I understand that the whole concept rests on this having a change agent in order to actually make change. But I think this goes along with kind of what you were just saying. Do you do you have to rely on this change agent being innovatively minded as they rise to this position or can you do you have ideas to change the ideas of people who are already in a position that could enact change but they, they currently don't think that way and if so how do you do that well that, that's a toughie um the I think, I don't have a good answer, okay, but I'm, I'm going to try. These big changes, uh, a lot of the big changes require a combination of bottom-up thinking and top-down thinking. Um, the basic idea has to be at least acceptable. It has to be sort of going around. And at, at which point the politicians are willing to get behind it. Depending on how unpopular it is, I mean, my, the bottles I have in mind are tobacco and gay marriage, for example, where finally the uh, the, um, the the politicians got behind what had previously been an unacceptably uh, uh, unacceptably unpopular idea. But some of these things are happening already. I mean, the uh, the manufacturing initiative, for example, of the present administration, um, and uh, and the establishment of of ARPA E are within range of these ideas. So I don't think that these are as, uh, as, as drastically uh, uh, unimaginable as they would have been, say, 10 years ago. Um, the, one of the big problems is that the, um, is the, uh, the division between the science and technology side, the things that just if we, if we just get the science straight, people will adopt it. And the economic side, which says, if we just get the prices right, the technology will emerge. Well, each of these has a problem. The science, science, the scientists are pushing this big rock uphill, and then finally they find that they can't do it because the environment is wrong. The economists are saying, well, we have to make these very unpopular changes in policy. And, and the industry says we can't do it. And you have to be able to say, well, sure you can do it. All you have to do is, you know, the technology is here. You have to, that, that, that's not so, it's not trivial. But it's, it's uh, but, it, but it's not hopeless, I think, is the bottom line. Other questions? So, let me suggest that the... <coughs> Mr. Tractor Yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. oh, sorry. Uh, Mike Tractor Bird, sometimes at Rutgers. Thank <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me suggest that, uh, from an economic perspective, the very term, market imperfections, 
is deleterious. And the reason I suggest that is that it starts from a normative worldview of how a market should theoretically operate with fantasy human beings operating in fantasy rational worlds. And that one old barrier, if you, you know, from vested interests onward, reflects the normal behavioral economics that, if addressed, um, could allow a more clinical, uh, if you will, in quotes, a more clinical approach to overcome these problems and therefore facilitate transfer. Let me give you an example. Uh, well, not yet here, but an example. If one wanted to get past the legacy of fossil fuel provided electricity, you might want to argue that wind and solar are a whole lot better. Well, that means that you, and you've got a bunch of people who are skilled in managing the electricity market. You may want to provide a vehicle for incentives wherein they continue their uh, professional activities, but change the feedstock. They're not vested to coal or to oil or to gas. They're vested to the economics and they're vested to the technology and self-fulfillment. So if one were to approach this as a behavioral quasi-medical problem, I think that there are alternate ways to, to address it. Um, I agree with everything you said except the first sentence, <laughs> because I think the uh, idea of market imperfection <coughs> is a very nice analytic tool. And I do not, uh, I don't subscribe to the idea that it has to necessarily be normative. I don't consider it to be normative. No, but I don't think it's, it's the, the way the world works, but it's a good way to start thinking about it. Um, other than that, we're in agreement. I'm going to ask a question to you. And somehow, I'm struck with your, your wagon heading piece is almost the same wagon here as the wagon you had that headed west. But it could be equipped with to look more like a James Bond vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. In that case, so what's not in your talk is that the, what do you call the non-legacy sectors? The adventurous sectors, the, the innovators, I guess the currently innovative sectors, do you have a word for the non-legacy Frontier, frontier sectors. The frontier So the frontier sectors can be enlisted in the job of modernizing the legacy sectors in ways that that might, it might be more productive, I'm sure you have thought of it, it might be productive to discuss here. For example, um, internet shopping has revolutionized retail trade, which one might have thought was a legacy sector until it happened. And in higher education, uh, there is this, these expect, there are the, at least some expectation that, the, that uh, internet learning and online, online learning will, will, will revolutionize the subject. Um, and then maybe you can ask what, what, will, what will determine whether it does or it doesn't. The, um, let, me, full, let me carry this idea forward. Anything you want. Um, it, if you can start with a niche and expand, then you have a classic disruptive cycle, a disruptive technology like the ones you mentioned. Um, the MOOCs are harder. Because the, oh, the, the massive online um, courses, what's the, uh, the, the, the open, oh, thank you, open online courses. Um, there are some things that you can learn very nicely with MOOCs, uh, calculus, accounting, that kind of thing, where it's just skills that, that take advantage <coughs> of, uh, of interactive testing. And there are other things that are not so good, like anything that requires you to, to think through a very complicated problem and write a 20-page paper on it. Um, the optimum is a blend of the two. Uh, and there are a variety of ways, variety of, ways of, of uh, blending <coughs> the online education with the traditional face-to-face -face education. <coughs> the danger is that um, because of various political and managerial pressures, a tremendous pressure on tuition, which are very familiar, I imagine, at least some people in this audience. Um, the easy way to apply MOOCs is to uh, use them as cost-saving devices. We'll get rid of all these pesky left-wing professors, and we'll just have one guy, uh, one guy on, 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 the, on the web that will, that will convey the information. 
And you can probably deliver a mediocre product that way, and you can save a whole bunch of money. Um, that's more or less what we did with, uh, with word processors. We got rid of secretaries, right? And answering machines, we got rid of receptionists with those. That would be the easy way. And the faculty is pushing back because they're worried about that. Um, so there's, uh, we, I'm summarizing a whole, there, there, there are several pages that Bill, that, that, uh, that, that, that Bill has published on, on this subject. Um, the pioneering universities that have established companies that are doing a beautiful job with MOOCs are also very wealthy universities, including MIT, Harvard, and Princeton, I believe. And they've got the money to do it. Other, other, uh, other uh, universities do not. And other, other universities are sticking their, to putting their toe in the water carefully. Uh, and they're getting a lot of pushback from the faculty and from the administrators and uh, from, from parents. So it's going to be a very interesting, it's going to be a very interesting uh, evolution to see how this thing comes out. But the generalization, when you say, what can the, what can the frontier, mm -hmm. the frontier industries help with the innovation in the legacy sectors, more generally? Is that a question that comes out of Yes. Um, there are, I think the, the best way to say that, the way, best way to answer that question is I think the cases that we look at will get this discussion going. Um, there, the, even, the, even when, you, when you apply our model to the cases, um, you find complications, which you know was, was all you could do to get the book written and get to get everything. But uh, there, the if we if we could just get a discussion going about how you address these legacy sectors and explore the kinds of complications that you are that you are probing, I think we'll we'll, we'll, we'll be ahead. And on the specific subject of the of the uh, higher education, there's a long discussion. Exactly that. Other questions? Stephen Mark, please go stand up. My name is uh, Reyes, and uh, I retired recently from a company which makes, uh, it's the biggest toothpaste manufacturer in the US and the whole thing. I retired in June. They were uh, very big innovation, uh, motors like uh, continuous innovation, and uh, you can make a difference. But at the same time, they have to downsize constantly in order to survive. Are the two situations that are compatible with each other innovative at the same time to limit the number of employees so that uh, people like Steve Jobs would be able to his job for being taken over by those who are left behind. And how do you marry the two objectives? It's the same thing, lean and innovative. The two objectives are staying lean and competitive on one end, innovating on the other. It's a minimum manpower at the same time. We encourage innovation in such an atmosphere. I suspect you know the. I suspect you know more about that than I do. I hey, just tell a quick anecdote, which I heard from a famous friend. This uh, is this politically political incorrect, but he says that the. Atmosphere in heaven is conducive to innovation because the police are British, the engineers are German, the cooks are French, the organizers are Dutch, <laughs> and the lovers are Italian. <laughs> <laughs> but in hell it's not conducive at all because the police are German, <laughs> the cooks are British, <laughs> the lovers, sorry, the engineers are French, <laughs> the organizers are Italian. And the lovers of Dutch. <laughs> 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 that note, I need to talk about innovation context. I want to say one thing. That I've talked several, several times, we need to start a discussion, start a conversation. I'm curious whether, where this fits in the Woodrow Wilson School curriculum in particular, the kinds of questions that will be interesting. And um, maybe we can discuss that a few of us afterwards with each other. It's here, by the way, for some of tomorrow. Some of you signed up, I want to talk with you further and have to sign up for his full calendar today. Let me know, because Chuck is staying a good part of tomorrow and his time is not scheduled. 
But let's hope that the discussion these attending to start here will take off. Let's thank you.